We're in Hebrews, uh, about the uh, 10th, 11th verse of chapter 4, so if you'll turn over there. Before we engage in our study, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, bless our study of thy word. We're grateful, Father, for those worthies of old who lived and served thee and were the occasion of putting down on paper thy divine words. May we ever study these and and incorporate them into our lives so that we may be better prepared and be servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. So it, uh, in verse 10, and that's where we left off for it, he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So it's, of course, in verse 9, uh, had the rest of what's called a sabbatism, and it's referring to the uh, seventh day, of creation where God rested, and that's uh, a t- type of uh, the rest that we will have in heaven. But he says in uh, verse 11, he's going to tell us how to gain that rest. He says, let us, now we know that anytime you say let us, it, it's a uh, an appeal, uh, yeah, an appeal or an invitation to an obligation. It's something that uh, we ought to do. Let us, therefore, be diligent. And, of course, wherever you see the word diligent, you, know, you get, need to give heed to it. You need to be uh, uh, put your shoulder to the task, so to speak, and labor. And, in fact, that's what... Uh, King James has has labor there rather than diligence. See, be diligent uh, to enter that rest. So this is saying that the rest is available. It's available to us. But it doesn't come automatically. It's going to have to be worked for. Uh, It doesn't come without an effort. So let us... Therefore, be diligent to enter that rest. That, that's our ultimate, ultimate goal, is that rest. Uh, lest in, anyone fall. <clears throat> now, when it says, lest anyone falls, that means that anyone can fall. There is a possibility of falling. And we don't want to fall according to the... Uh, same example of disobedience that's already been mentioned. And we might look at uh, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 12, and I think that's probably appropriate to read that here. It says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not pleased. So, you know, we want to be diligent, not do what they did. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should... Uh, not lust after evil evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play and that was not a good thing that kind of play said nor let us commit uh, sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents, nor complained, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happened to them as examples. There are examples. 
and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We should be diligent not to fall in these uh, uh, sins that these people were guilty of. <clears throat> in uh, verse uh, 12, it's uh, one that I'm sure you, you all know quite well. And this tells us why we should be uh, earnest and uh, particular in our Christian endeavors. He said, for the word of God is living and powerful. That is, it is able to judge us as uh, it's stated in John 12, 48. It says there, who rejects me and does not receive my words as that which judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in that last day. Now, th this is not an abstraction, but it's an embodiment of God's will. It is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. <clears throat> so the, the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. Now, all these things paint a picture of the uh, the uh, whole of man, the incorporeal uh, nature of man, all that man is. Uh, the Word, it will be able to pierce all that. Anything that you are, the Word will find you out. And the Word, again, of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So there's nothing that can be... Uh, hidden from God, and we'll read about that just a little bit later. There's nothing can be hidden from him. In 13, it says, for there is no creature hidden from his sight. So all of us are uh, visible in his sight. So where he's been speaking about Jesus and the power that he has as a high priest and apostle and the king and so forth, but, you know, Jesus is just one of the uh, Godhead, so God himself is powerful too. <clears throat> the Word is powerful, God is powerful, Christ, is, they're all powerful. But he says there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So when we have to give an account, there is not going to be any excuses, and there's not going to be any subterfuge when it comes to giving an account before God. In Second Corinthians 5.10, it said, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. <clears throat> in verse 14, uh, verse uh, 14 really starts another section. <clears throat> And uh, it's, it, you know, probably wouldn't have been better to be included in chapter 5, but nevertheless, it starts another section. And that section runs on to uh, somewhere in the 10th chapter. It says in verse 14, Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the, through the heavens, and that's passed through... You know, there, there's three heavens that are mentioned, but he's passed through all of them, all of them, and uh, he's passed through to the most holy place, the uh, sanctuary and the uh, true tabernacle, Hebrews 8, verse 2, if you want to look at that. He said, pass through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our Confession. Now, he's talking to the Hebrew Christians, and they're thinking about uh, renouncing Christ or not holding true their confession. So the, the fact is that to renounce confession, if the uh, Hebrew Christians renounce their confession, they're also renouncing Christ. So in verse uh, 15, for we do not have a high priest, and that, of course, refers to 
Christ and not the uh, Aaronic uh, priesthood. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but it was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That intrigued me as to, uh, I think I asked David about this, the difference between uh, seduction and temptation. And uh, so I found an article by Johann Heinrich August Eberard. He's a, he's a German theologian. And he talks about this. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with it entirely, but he, he does talk about this. He, but it also addresses the uh, idea of, of Christ himself being tempted. He says, being tempted is, on the one hand, something different from being seduced. And on the other hand, it is something different from mere physical suffering. He who is seduced stands not in a purely passive relation, but with his own will acquiesces to the will of the seducer. But he who is tempted as such is, uh, is purely passive. I'm not sure I uh, can hold you by into that, but nevertheless, I would say that uh, all uh, seduction is based on temptation, but not all, all temptation re results in seduction. But nevertheless, it's one man's opinion. Uh, this, however, is not, it's talking about uh, temptation is purely passive. This, however, is not merely physical passivity. Headache, as such, is no temptation. And when he's talking about temptation being passive, you know, that's, that's something that's just, uh, you, you know, you may not go out and seek it. You know, that may not be active in seeking it, but it, it does happen to you. Uh, but there is a moral obligation lying upon every man not to let himself be mastered by his natural affections. And I might say that is, uh, which we all have, which in themselves are all, altogether sinless, but rather to acquire the mastery over them. That a poor man loves his children and cannot bear that they perish of hunger is in itself natural and a sinless affection. But let him be so placed as that without danger of discovery, he could steal a piece of money, then that natural affection becomes to him a temptation. He wants to take the money to, to uh, buy food. <clears throat> now it is quite clear that a man may in this way find himself in a situation of being tempted without it being, necessary, it being necessary to suppose that there is therefore an evil inclination. The poor man may be a truly honest Christian man. The temptation is there. The thought is present to his mind in all the force of a natural affection. And he says to himself, if I were at liberty to take this gold, how I might appease the hunger of my children but at the same time he has an immediate and lively sense of his duty and not a breath of desire moves him to take the gold. He knows that he dare not do this. It is a settled thing with him that he is not a thief. So it is in reference to the temptation of Christ. He was tempted in every respect, in joy and sorrow, in fear and hope, in the most varied situations but without sin, the being tempted was to him purely passive, purely objective. He had already uh, made up his mind that those temptations, he was never going to yield to them. So whenever they came, he just said, that's not for me. No inclination to evil ever defiled his pure spirit. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life had no place in his affections. Therefore, although he was tempted by the devil through all the avenues of natural desires of the human heart, he was still without sin. He had made up his mind that he was not going to yield to those natural affections that, uh, that we all have. <clears throat> so can we do that? Well, we can certainly work on it. <laughs> but the fact of the matter, all have sin. <clears throat> But anyway, in uh, verse 16, he says, 
therefore, in light of all these things, let us therefore come boldly to the uh, throne of God and that we may uh, obtain mercy and find grace in, in time of need. Now, how can we come boldly to the throne of God? Well, we can do it through prayer. In uh, Ephesians 6, verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all pers perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known to God. And then in Ephesians 5, 17, of course, it says, Pray without ceasing. So we can... Uh, boldly come before the throne of God, making our request known, knowing that he will answer our prayers. We can do that through prayer. And it says through the throne of God, if we look at Zechariah, the sixth chapter, uh, uh, verse uh, 12 and 13, He says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Receive the gift from the captives from hell, die, and down, and so forth. I really want to get down to uh, where it talks about the, the Messiah. Behold, the man whose name is the branch. From this place he shall branch out. He shall build the temple of the Lord. And he's not talking about a, a physical temple here. He's not talking about like Herod's temple or... Solomon's temple. He's talking about the uh, spiritual temple that's going to be built. He said, He shall bear the glory and it shall sit and rule on his throne while well, a king sits on the throne. So he's this, this one, the branch, is going to be a king. And he shall be a priest on his throne. He's going to be a high priest. And the, the council of uh, peace shall between, be between them both. So, uh, that's where we should come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. And we will certainly have times of need. In chapter 5, he says, For every high priest is taken from among men, uh, is appointed for men, in things pertaining to God, uh, may offer that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices of sin. So he says, for every high priest taken from a man, well, the high priest up to this time was taken from men, from the uh, uh, particularly the family of Aaron, the tribe of Levi. All the priests came from the tribe, the tribe of Levi. But the uh, high priest came from the lineage of Aaron, from the tribe of Levi, only. No one could serve uh, at the uh, altar except the priest, and certainly the, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Now, you may recall uh, Uzziah, uh, he decided that he could offer incense uh, at the altar, and when he did that, uh, a bunch of priests, that 80 priests, and he called them valiant men. And that's in Second uh, Chronicles 26, chapter verses 26 through 21, if you want to read that. So there's these 80 priests that went into Isaiah and said, they stood him to his uh, face and said, it is not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense, get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord. So no, only the uh, priest could do that. Of course, uh, as I've been king, he got mad about it. And he uh, had uh, was afflicted with leprosy as a result of it, and he had uh, leprosy until the day he died. So it was only the uh, uh, those of the lineage of Aaron. And so 
Paul, if he's the writer, he's laying the groundwork to show that Christ is now the high priest. And he lays that groundwork by saying, you know, what the work of the high priest uh, was. And it only came from men, from certain appointed men. And, and again, talking about the uh, high priest in, in verse 2 of chapter 5, he said, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray. Now, a uh, high priest was not only uh, served the, at the altar and stuff like that, because he's also, he judged uh, the people. If they engaged in some sort of sin, he had to uh, make a judgment as to whether that was an ignorant, ignorant sin, in which case they would have, you know, offer some sort of sacrifice. But if it was a presumptuous, presumptuous sin, uh, then they would uh, be put to death. But being men, they it, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between uh, a presumptive sin and one of ignorance. It can be elements both. So he had this uh, high priest, or the priest had to be a man of uh, ex experience, He'd be able to discern these things. He had to be mature. Had to have compassion, and he had to be on those that uh, were going astray, ignorant, going astray. Uh, since he himself is also subject to weakness, the high priest was still a man, and uh, you know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So he also uh, was could sin. So he had to keep that in mind in, in making judgment between the uh, types of sin that had been engaged in and, and, and make a judgment as to whether or not they're uh, sins of ignorance or sins of, uh, you know, presumptive type of sin. And since he's also subject to weakness, since he knows that, he can uh, better exercise forbearance and compassion when it's called for, and he can be uh, resolute when that's called for. In verse 3, it says, because of this, uh, he is required for the people, in the fact that he could also sin, he had to uh, uh, offer sacrifices for sin. And you recall that the high priest uh, would, uh, well, when he's consecrated, he was... Uh, consecrated with blood, but whenever he went into the Holy of Holies once a year to offer sacrifice for the people for sins committed in ignorance, he had to uh, douse himself, sprinkle himself with the blood before he can go in for his own sins. So he had to do that first. So in verse 4, in no man takes this honor to himself, which means it's not a, a sinecure. If you, uh, you, I'm not. I'm sure that's not a word you run across very often. But a, a sinecure uh, was much more common back in the uh, maybe Elizabethan England and what have you. When you had a political rival that you wanted to get out of the way, you just give him some sort of religious office that he didn't do anything but he got paid you know that sort of deal and it's uh, I guess the closest thing we have are uh, you know these uh, office seeker uh, office holder seekers you know they want a job from the government they don't want to really do anything they just want to get paid so that's a, a sinecure and uh, this office was not that they actually had to do something. So no man takes his honor to himself, but he is called, he, he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So Aaron and his family were called to be uh, the lineage for the high priest, and the family of Levi was to be the lineage of all other priests. In verse 5, so he said, and so, Christ, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. 
you know, he wasn't, he occupied that office because it was necessary for the people. But it was he, that's uh, God the Father, uh, that's one who uh, glorified him, who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that's the, the uh, time that he was, of course, raised from the dead. And he went on to uh, occupy the throne in heaven as both king and high priest. And that comes from, and of course, we mentioned it uh, before, from Psalms, second chapter, verse uh, 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are, you are my son, today I have uh, begotten you. In Acts uh, 33, 13, 33, again, uh, the same quotation from Psalms, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my God, my son, today I have begotten you. And it's, we know this is at the time of the resurrection because in, in uh, Romans verse one, chapter 1, verse 4, it said he, declared, he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And it was God the Father that raised him from the dead. In verse 6, he uh, continues on, and he also says in another place, uh, you are a priest forever. Uh, and, and this forever is the time that uh, uh, during the time until the kingdom is delivered back up to uh, the Father. He said, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And this, this time deal... We look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, it says, uh, Then comes the end. And then, uh, when he delivers the kingdom to God and Father, and he puts to end all rule and all authority and all power. So at that point in time, um, his kingship and so forth, that's all been delivered up in heaven. The kingdom, at that point, that point in time, uh, no longer exists. The church has been delivered. <clears throat> In uh, verse 7, <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about this more in, in chapter 7, but it, it uh, references the Messianic Psalm, the 110th Psalm. And verse 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. And King James says, uh, because he feared. And if you look at uh, Luke, the 22nd chapter, verses 40 through 44, it says there, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation, and he was withdrawn from about a stone's throw, and he knew, knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, something that we ought to pray as well. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthened him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Sometimes we uh, may get the impression that, you know, the, the part of Jesus that was God, that he didn't go through all these things that uh, we know that man would go through if he uh, had to endure what he endured. But he was man also. So he endured all the fears and pain and anticipation and that anybody would in this situation would uh, experience and as a man he didn't want to go through it but he also knew that for the benefit of mankind he had to 
And so he endured these things for our benefit. Now, it could be that the whole world from the time of creation to this time today, all humans have been perfect, except you, whichever one you want me to point out. And that being the case, Christ would still have had to die for your sins. But of course, as I say, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So, uh, but the fact is that if there's one sin in the world, he had to die to save that person from his sins. And it says in verse 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things uh, which he suffered. Well, he was never not obedient, but he says he learned it. Well, what he learned was the, uh, the uh, duty and the necessity of obedience. And he learned that by the things he suffered. And so, you know, we... None of us likes to, to uh, suffer, but it, it does have a place in uh, perfecting our character. And it says here in verse 9, in having been perfected, that, that's not being made perfect because he was perfect, but it's been made suitable for the task that he was sent here to, to uh, fulfill. And having been perfected by the, you know, by the things he suffered, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So this qualified him to be the perfect sacrifice. The fact that he perfected for the things that he was here to do, suitable for the things that he was uh, here to do, and that was through suffering, he became the author. And the author is one who uh, create something you know you usually think of uh, creates a writing that's an author but he came came the uh, author of eternal salvation so eternal salvation comes from him but this qualifier here <clears throat> it says to all who obey him Matthew seven twenty one. it says not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father. Reward in heaven has always been conditional. Punishment in hell has always been conditional. And we are the masters of those conditions. So we are the ones that decide where our ultimate uh, uh, boat will be. So, So we'll start next Wednesday. <laughs> verse 10, we'll start with verse 10. <clears throat> 